counsel in their everyday lives. In the summer of 1874, Adventist in Mechanicsburg, and this is what the town used to look like, took a firm stand against the use of tobacco in their new meeting house. They actually printed up cards prohibiting smoking on the premises of their Adventist meeting house. And they handed them to the strangers, that was our term for non-Adventists, who attended their services. Believers in Bunker Hill went even further when they all, 100%, consented to give up tobacco, meat, and coffee, beginning in the winter of 1875. Not to be outdone, the members in Deedsville not only gave up tobacco in 1877, but embraced the full message of health in diet, hygiene, and exercise. Once the Indiana Tract and Missionary Society and several local T&M societies were organized, their members began selling copies of the Health Reformer, which is its old title, and Good Health, its new title. Canvassers first made certain, of course, that Adventists subscribed to this magazine themselves, and its entrance into members' homes soon began to make a profound difference in their lifestyles. The temperance-minded saints in the Noblesville Adventist Church even hosted the first Indiana Health and Temperance Society conference in August of 1879. So you can fill that in on your worksheets. Noblesville, Seventh Adventist Church, first Health and Temperance Society conference. Two months later, when it was reorganized at Rochester with Dr. Hill as president and Sadie Edwards as secretary treasurer, the IHTS had 139 members statewide. The health reform message was beginning to change lives across the Indiana Conference. Since we're at camp meeting, why not talk about camp meetings in the 19th century? They were quite different from what you and I are experiencing today. Here's a camp meeting. 19th century Adventist camp meetings, which normally lasted one or two weeks, featured enthusiastic but long sermons, exuberant but not always harmonious singing, emotional and short personal testimonies, exciting mission stories from exotic places, and often scores of baptisms. It required much muscle and sweat to prepare the grounds, pitch the tents, cook the food over open fires, feed the horse teams, spread tons of straw on the ground, organize the services, and police the campsite. At old-fashioned camp meetings, one heard bells ringing, children shouting, believers singing, and horses nickering in their stalls. One smelled hot canvas, wet straw, fresh manure, and nutritious, but not always delicious, meals in the food tent. Depending on the location and the time of year, one felt the blistering sun, the chilling wind, the driving rain, or the pounding hail. Looking around, one could see bearded, gray-haired ministers in black, three-piece, Wool suits. Yeah. Women in snow white blouses and dark ankle length dresses. Little boys in knickers and girls in skirts and hats. Camp meeting was a time for joyful reunions, tearful confessions, generous giving, and heartfelt commitments. In an era when paid vacations were unknown in America, Adventists joyfully took time off from their work to attend what Elder J. and Lepro called Feasts of Tabernacles. One fact to keep in mind about 19th century Adventist camp meetings is that they were both revivalistic, that is for Adventist members, and evangelistic 
to convert the public. Consequently, instead of creating one central campground, as you have here in Cicero, the pioneers moved the big tents almost every summer to a different location. Let's take a closer look at some of the features of these camp meetings. And here's the list of the places where the 1870s camp meetings were held. In 1870, the first camp meeting in the state converted at Tipton near Kokomo because it had easy access to the Peru and Indianapolis Railroad. And James and Ellen White were there. Joining them was W.H. Littlejohn and several preachers from the Ohio Conference at this short October 6 through 10 convocation. Workers pitched one large tent for general meetings and five smaller tents for church groups with dividing canvas, dividing the women from the men in the church tents. They urged individuals to secure old Civil War Army pup tents if they wished to tent on their own as a family. James White, writing in the review, stated that this gathering left non-Adventist attendees favorably and deeply impressed, especially with the good order that prevailed. One Quaker and another Methodist woman told Mrs. White that no religious influence had ever made so deep an impression on the citizens of Tipton as this Adventist camp meeting. Knowing that many of the men opposed women speaking in public, these non-Adventist ladies prayed for Ellen White as she preached. Following the service, many Christians invited Mrs. White to speak in their Sunday-keeping churches. The second camp meeting was held at Greason's Grove, about three miles west of Fairfield and five miles north of Kokomo on the Peru and Indianapolis Railroad. It was also short, lasting from September 21 to 26. This time, the conference provided horse teams to convey the attendees and their baggage from the railroad station to the campgrounds. In addition to the large tent, which was borrowed from the Michigan Conference, campers could dine at the provision tent and purchase hay and grain for their horses at the feed tent. Speakers included James and Ellen White, W.H. Littlejohn, J.H. Wagner, and J.N. Andrews. William Covert urged believers to come and enjoy a rare feast of good things. And they certainly did. Over 200 Hoosier Adventists attended, bringing their straw ticks, their quilts, their cloth tents with them. They purchased a wide variety of fresh fruits and vegetables at the food tent. Many of them stayed in the 12 cabins that were built especially for the occasion. On Sunday, nearly 2,000 local citizens crowded onto the grounds. 20 of them came forward for prayers. Albert Lane baptized 17 of them in a stream five miles from the campgrounds. A generous offering was raised, $400. That'd be about $10,000 today for the Western Health Reform Institute and the Review and Herald Publishing Association. From August 19 to 24, 1872, Believers converged on a grove eight miles west of Kokomo, near the Burlington and Kokomo Pike Road. This time, all the tents were organized in a large circle with each church's name printed on white muslin signs bordered with holly and fresh green leaves attached to the front of the tent. So popular was the Kokomo area for gatherings that from September 18 to 22, 1873, believers took the New London and Kokomo Dirt Road to Rails Grove, four and a half miles west of Kokomo. This particular camp meeting also marked the first session of the newly organized Indiana Conference. And the General Conference president was there. 
George I. Butler, who preached at the large tent, reported this was the largest gathering of Adventists in the state of Indiana, filling 16 family tents. Attendees gave $1,000 for Battle Creek College, $160 for the Indiana Tract and Missionary Society, $250 for the General Conference Fund. On the negative side, however, Elder Butler noted that the debating spirit was too strong in Indiana. And he hoped that next year, when camp meeting convened, a nearby farmer's hogs might be kept away at a distance from the tents by fencing them in, as the porkers were much too loud and smelled much too bad. When the 1873 camp meeting convened at Rails Grove from September 24 to 29, the porkers had been penned up, which was a good thing, since the top brass attended that camp meeting, including James and Ellen White, Stephen Haskell, who came all the way from Massachusetts, and Albert and Ellen Lane. This time, 200 Adventists pitched 22 tents in a large circle. Over 1,500 local citizens attended on Sunday. Attendees gave $200 to the Systematic Benevolence Fund, $500 for the New Pacific Press, another $500 for the book work in Indiana, and a further $200 for the General Conference. Half the people present came forward for a prayer of dedication and 16 of them were baptized in nearby Wildcat Creek, where, well, tears trickled down the faces of many watching on the riverbank. During a social meeting, nearly all of the 1,500 individuals gave short testimonies, many with tears in their eyes. In 1875, conference leaders chose to hold the fall camp meeting at Bunker Hill, Indiana. For the first time, Adventists who boarded the trains at 10 stations on the Indianapolis, Peru, and Chicago Railroad received reduced excursion tickets to attend this camp meeting, a practice that would become standard here in Indiana and indeed across the United States. You could travel by half fare if you were going to an Adventist camp meeting. From October, oh, and the preachers got to travel free. Preachers travel free on the railroads. From October 7 to 12, the camp meeting speakers included <clears throat> James and Ellen White, Dudley M. Canwright, and Uriah Smith, as well as Sands Lane and H.M. Kenyon, facing freezing rain and morning ice on their wash balls. 200 Adventists shivering in their 21 tents lit wood stoves to keep warm. After Canwright preached a two-hour sermon on the pillars of our faith, 10 listeners stood up <clears throat> to signify their desire to keep the Sabbath. And once he had broken the ice on the nearby river, Elder Kenyon baptized 23 converts. How would you like to be baptized in a frozen river? Despite chattering teeth, union and harmony prevailed <clears throat> throughout the gathering, Uriah Smith declared. <clears throat> After freezing to death at the 1875 camp meeting, conference leaders moved the dates up a month to September 14, 18, 1876, hoping for warmer weather when the meetings began on the Peru fairgrounds. Adventists were instructed to take the Toledo and Wabash Railroad or the Indianapolis, Peru, and Chicago Railroad. Either way, they could travel for half fare in the centennial year. Ellen White, who was there with her husband James and Dudley M. Canwright, as well as Hoosier ministers William Harvey, W.W. W. Sharp, and William Covert, <clears throat> since the fairgrounds boasted six large, empty buildings beneath its large, spreading oak trees, Fewer Adventists had to pitch tents this time. Following the Whites' preaching, 50 sinners, backsliders, and the lukewarm, as they were described, 
came forward for prayers. And for half an hour, many of them wept and praised God. Hundreds of local citizens attended on Sunday to see Harvey, Sharp, and Covert ordained to the gospel ministry and to witness the immersion of 20 converts. Yet so many of the saints long for the delightfully shaded beach groves near Kokomo that the 1877 camp meeting returned there from August 9 to 14. They arrived on one of four railroads bisecting this village of only 4,000 inhabitants. The Indianapolis Railroad, the Peru and Chicago Railroad, the Panhandle Railroad, or the Frankfurt and Kokomo Railroad. Each congregation was urged to buy a tent rather than rent one, but all were assured there would be ample provisions for man and beast. This time around, 300 Adventists in 26 church and family tents completed the circle. Two local editors, including the editor of the Kokomo Dispatch, also promised to give full coverage to the meetings in their paper, free of charge. Once again, Ellen White, J.H. Wagner, Sands Lane did most of the preaching. Mrs. White was delighted by the natural setting, describing the campground as canopied by interlacing branches that formed a natural roof of leaves, so dense that during a slight shower, scarcely a drop of rain sifted through. That's almost poetic, isn't it? However, a heavier rainstorm on Sabbath broke up the meeting when Elder Lane was preaching. Ellen White had praise words for Hoosier Adventists. We have not met at any of our camp meetings a more intelligent, earnest, and truth-loving people than in Indiana. Many of them are persons of education and influence. So pat yourselves on the back. Hopefully that's still true. Hopefully you are still intelligent, earnest, and truth-loving. After her temperance lecture, which, by the way, was on Sunday and was attended by 8,000 people, the vast majority of them strangers. And that 8,000 was twice the population of Kokomo at the time. So they're coming in from all over the countryside. She asked those who had given up tobacco to stand, and nearly 40 did so. 12 of the 40 were women. Dr. Hill and his wife, the local WCTU leader, converted to Adventism at that meeting. Ellen especially enjoyed social meetings where brief testimonies full of life and cheerful hope and edifying to all who heard them were shared. Afterwards, 50 sinners and backsliders came forward for prayers. 15 were baptized, including Dr. Hill and his wife and their mute daughter. And Arthur W. Bartlett was ordained to the gospel ministry by Elder Wagner and Elder Lane. This meeting, Ellen White declared, was one of the best of its kind we ever witnessed. From August 14 to 19, 1878, Adventists returned to the campground near Kokomo with its shady grove and nearby stream for baptizing converts. Hoping to bring a new impetus to mission work in the state, conference officials invited elders S.N. Haskell and C.W. Stone to encourage members to become literature evangelists. Lane urged believers to become burning lights in a well-trained army of call porters blanketing the state of Indiana. As the number of Adventists grew exponentially across Indiana by the end of the decade, conference leaders decided in 1879 to hold not one, but two camp meetings. One in Rochester, for those living in the northern section of the state, and another one in Noblesville, for those dwelling near the center. The Noblesville camp meeting, held in a beautiful grove, convened first from August 5 to 11. The 250 attendees who paid half fare on the Indianapolis, Peru, and Chicago Railroad, or the Anderson, Lebanon, and St. Louis Railroad, rented 24 tents of varying sizes for only three to four dollars each. Elder D.M. Canwright and Ellen White's son, Willie White, W.C. White, did most of the preaching. And Willie White presided over the Indiana Tract and Missionary Society meeting, as well as over the first 
Sabbath School Convention held in Indiana. So Rochester, you take the prize. First Sabbath School Convention, 1879, Rochester. A report published in the review by Elder J.P. Henderson stated, the spirit of the Lord was present during all the meetings. Attendees purchased $72 worth of books, subscribed to 74 magazines, and bought $30 worth of health food at the provision tent. At the close of the meetings, Elders Covert and J.M. Rees baptized 34 converts by the railroad bridge on the nearby White River, a solemn service which left many of the 3,000 to 4,000 local citizens watching in tears. Almost two months later, a camp meeting was held in Rochester from September 30 to October 6, 1879, with James and Ellen White attending as the main speakers. This proved to be a particularly important convocation because both the Indiana Health and Temperance Society and the Indiana Sabbath School Association were organized in Rochester on October 5, the first with 139 members. 19 churches sent 21 delegates to form the Sabbath School Association. They elected J.M. Rees as president and Viola Schrock as secretary. So let's sum up the condition of Adventism in Indiana in the 1870s. The 1870s witnessed an explosion of Adventist activity across Indiana. Thanks to the organization of the Indiana Conference, 1872, the formation of the Indiana Tract Missionary Society and the local branches called Vigilant Missionary Societies in 1873, the Indiana Health and Temperance Society, 1879, and the Sabbath School Association, also 1879. Financially, the conference also benefited from the paradigm shift away from the 1859 Systematic Benevolence Plan, by which members contributed 10% of their annual increase from one year to the next, and the adoption in 1878 of the Biblical Tithing Plan by which members gave 10% of their annual income. You see the difference, increase, income. They're two different things. The impact of organization quickly became evident in several areas. First, the ministerial workforce doubled from one ordained evangelist and three licensed ones in 1872 to four ordained ministers and five licensed ones by 1879. Second, the number of local Adventist congregations quadrupled from five in 1872 to 20 in 1879. However, due to the panic of 1873, a nationwide economic depression, systematic benevolence giving actually declined throughout the decade from $930 in 1873, $500 in 75, only $300 in 1878. Aggressive evangelism throughout the state, however, brought the three angels' messages to many new areas. Out-of-state evangelists such as Albert and Sands Lane and Joseph Wagner assisted a Hoosier ministerial team consisting of Charles Seward, Ezra Brackett, H.M. Kenyon, W.W. W. Sharp, William Covert, A.W. Bartlett, J.T. Richards, and J.S. Schrock in holding meetings in dozens of hamlets, villages, and towns across the state, even entering the southeastern and southwestern corners of Indiana by 1879. And yet, as the frontiers of Adventism advanced, the forces of opposition also grew stronger and more determined to halt its progress. Ministers belonging to the Disciples of Christ, the Methodist, the United Brethren, the Presbyterian, and the Lutheran churches proved particularly hostile to Adventist evangelists who preached the Seventh-day Sabbath, the state of the dead, and the perpetuity of God's law. Paid professional debaters, particularly from the Disciples of Christ and the Methodist Church, frequently challenged Adventist ministers in debates that often lasted several days or even a week or two. As this uh, Part of our lecture shows audience votes demonstrated that Adventists always won these debates so long as both sides agreed to abide by the Bible. In addition, this chapter has shown that occasionally tent efforts were hampered 
by threats from ruffians, by secret slander campaigns, by attacks of disease and illness. Despite such challenges, however, 27 new Adventist congregations were established in the 1870s across the conference. Likewise, by 1879, Sabbath schools and quarterly meetings were regularly being held at 31 different Adventist centers. Certainly one of the reasons for the rapid spread of Adventism in the 1870s was the growth in the number of call porters, a literature distribution team organized by the new tract and missionary societies. As we've seen, the brothers Sands and Albert Lane deserve the blue ribbon as the top book salesman at their tent meetings. But after 1875, a Hoosier canvassing team consisting of A.W. Bartlett, William Sharp, William Covert, J.P. Henderson, and J.M. Rees joined the lanes in spreading Adventist publications like the leaves of autumn. When the Indiana Tract and Missionary Society was established in 1872, scores of laymen and laywomen began selling or giving away hundreds of pages of tracts, pamphlets, and books. If the literature ministry in Indiana was expanding rapidly, however, the cause of health reform, as we've seen, lagged somewhat behind. As many new converts in Indiana struggle to quit smoking and chewing tobacco, eating meat and drinking tea and coffee. Nonetheless, we have learned that seven Adventist congregations wholeheartedly adopted the health and dress reform message. Mechanicsburg in 74, Bunker Hill in 75, Deedsville in 77, Marion, Yorktown, and Alexandria in 78, and Noblesville in 79. Once Hoosier Adventists began reading and sharing copies of the health reformer renamed Good Health, after 1878, the cause of healthful living advanced more rapidly. It certainly received a shot in the arm with the formation of the Indiana Health and Temperance Society in 1879. Another very effective proselytizing method was inviting the public to attend Adventist camp meetings at a different location every year. As we've seen, during the decade, camp meetings were convened in the Kokomo area six times, as well as once each at Fairfield, Bunker Hill, Peru, Noblesville, and Rochester. Well, Adventists attended these Feast of Tabernacles by the hundreds. Local citizens frequently came to Sunday services by the thousands. And baptisms in nearby rivers and lakes followed the five or six day gatherings. In Indiana, business meetings often convened at camp meetings. And as well, the delegates elected their conference officers Ministers were ordained, tent evangelists were assigned their new territories, and new conference policies and resolutions were passed. We have also seen, however, that the plans created by men and women could often be thwarted by Mother Nature. Heavy rains in 1870, 76, 77, and 79, heavy blizzards in 72, sometimes interrupted Adventist meetings and made it difficult, if not impossible, for local citizens to attend them. Frequent complaints about the knee-deep mud on Indiana's rural roads. <clears throat> Aren't you thankful they're paved today? In 1873, 78, and 79, likewise forced many to hike through the fields instead, while others simply stayed home. Occasional epidemics also prevented some from getting to the meetings. I think in our remaining few moments here, I'm going to jump forward into the 1880s, the evangelizing saints, before we close. If the 1870s might be called the decade of organization, the 1880s could be nicknamed the decade of consolidation and expansion. When the delegates gathered at Rochester for the first conference session of the decade in 1880, 19 churches sent representatives and 10 ministers, five credentialed, five licensed, served across the state. Delegates elected Sands Lane as president, W.A. Young as secretary, and Dr. William Hill as treasurer. They voted three new churches, Greensboro, Sevastopol, and Walkerton, 
into the fold. The delegates passed resolutions thanking Ellen White for her testimonies of rebuke. They urged ministers to study her writings. They instructed churches to elect elders and deacons annually and urged them to send their members' ties to the conference headquarters in a timely manner so that our ministers may be paid. The 1881 session, which met in Marion, re-elected the same three officers and admitted the Kiwana Adventist Church to the conference. The delegates also sent their sympathies to Ellen White on the recent death of her husband two months earlier. And they also sent sympathy to Elder Albert Lane on the passing of his wife, Ellen. And the conference also sent their sympathies to the family of United States President James A. Garfield following his murder by Leon Salzgas. A year later, meeting once again in Marion, they listened to the encouraging reports from the Indiana Sabbath School Association with Elder J.M. Rees, elected as president, and Leona Morrell as secretary treasurer. Indiana now boasted 23 Sabbath schools, nearly one for every local church. They also rejoiced that the Indiana Tract and Missionary Society, now in its 10th year, had 200 members. Sands Lane was president, William Covert vice president, and W.A. Young secretary treasurer. Traveling to Bunker Hill for the 12th conference session in 1883, the 25 delegates and 15 ordained and licensed ministers voted to admit the congregations in Jonesboro, Fowler, Kokomo, Northfield, Farmersburg, and Denver into the conference. They also resolved to follow the health reform message more faithfully. They resolved to start a city mission in Indianapolis to hold more tent meetings in the major cities across the state and to seek a closer connection with God. The following year, 38 delegates from 26 churches met in Logansport and granted the congregations in Hartford, Prairie Creek, and Radnor membership in the conference. The 1884 session issued licenses to seven call porters testifying to the rapidly expanding literature work across the state. After re-electing the same three officers, they passed resolutions to place copies of Mrs. White's book, The Great Controversy, in every Adventist home. They resolved to expand the work among the German residents in Indiana and to raise $5,000 for home missions, $1,000 for education, $3,000 for Battle Creek College, $1,000 for South Lancaster Academy, and $5,000 for mission work in England and across Europe. A total of $15,000, which in today's value would equal $375,000. Amazing. After serving the cause in Indiana for 15 years, Elder Sands Lane received a call to ministry elsewhere. When he and his brother Albert had arrived in the state in 1870, Indiana had about 50 Adventists in three companies. By 1885, there were nearly 1,000 Adventists and 20 scattered meeting houses, indicating that the membership had grown 2,000% in 15 years. The delegates to the 85 session elected Elder William Covert to replace Lane as president. Dedicated to missionary work, Covert rallied Hoosier Adventists behind his dream of purchasing $3,500 property in Indianapolis to establish an inner city mission. The building boasted a kitchen, sitting room, sleeping rooms, parlor, storerooms, and a chapel for 180 persons. At the 1886 state gathering in Mechanicsburg, the following spring, delegates voted to field six tents that summer, the largest number of evangelistic efforts ever held in the state of Indiana. Four months later, when the 14th conference session convened at Wabash in September of 87, 56 delegates from 29 churches voted to admit five companies, Akron, Duggar, Mudlick, Pleasant Lake, and Poseyville to conference membership. They reelected William Covert as president W.A. Young as secretary, and William Hill as treasurer. Despite having 16 ministers, eight ordained and eight licensed, 
40 churches and 1,000 members, President Colbert warned that Indiana was losing ministerial laborers to other conferences simply because it was so deep in debt that unless tithes and offerings doubled in the fourth quarter, we cannot pay our indebtedness in full, he said. He estimated that if 1,000 Adventists made $100 a year and paid an honest tithe, the conference would have $10,000. Instead, it received an average of only $4 a year per member. It weighs upon my mind till I lose many hours of sleep each week, Covert exclaimed. And then he challenged the members, if you have been delinquent, pay up. It would bring much joy in heaven. As well as more sleep-filled nights for himself. He also encouraged the small army of call porters to spread out across the state. One canvasser reported that 30 individuals had converted through reading Adventist books. In 1888, several call porters living at the Indianapolis Mission blanketed the city with tracts, books, and magazines. When the 22 delegates convened there for the 17th session that, session that fall, they voted to add the Waldron, Maxwell, Indianapolis, Northside, and Napanee churches to the conference. When the general conference reassigned Elder Covert to a new field, they elected Elder Frank D. Starr as the conference president. As his name implies, the new president was a star supporter of every aspect of Adventist outreach. During 1889, he crisscrossed the state, exhorting members to get involved in the Tract and Missionary Society and the canvassing work to take active roles in their local Sabbath schools, to give Bible readings to their neighbors, to take practice and preach health reform, and to speak out and sign petitions opposing the NRA. And that's not the National Rifle Association. The NRA is the National Reform Association, which was backing U.S. Senator Blair's bill for a national Sunday law pointing out that the conference tent fund was empty, he urged members to send their pledges to J.W. Moore at the conference headquarters, which was located at 175 Central Avenue in downtown Indianapolis. And we'll close with this. Consequently, when the 28 delegates convened for the fall 1889 session in Kokomo, the outlook for the conference had brightened somewhat. After re-electing the same three officers, the delegates voted to admit the Angola Church to the conference, to disband the Olive Branch Church because the members had joined the Idaville Church, and to remove two churches, rename, I should, should say, two churches. Fowler became Lachiel, and Forest Chapel became Olivet Chapel. They also thanked Ellen White for her recent testimonies they vowed to support the Indianapolis mission with their funds and prayers, to double their efforts to sign petitions against the Blair Bill, and to distribute copies of the new Adventist paper, the American Sentinel, the forerunner of Liberty Magazine today. All right, I hope we'll see you this afternoon as we dive deeper into the 1880s and see the amazing expansion of the work here in Indiana. Let's close with prayer. Loving Lord, we thank you so much that it is you, Jesus Christ, who is in the details and not the devil. We thank you for the expanding work that's been going on here in Indiana. And as we learn these stories about these pioneers and their sacrifices in all kinds of weather, on horrible roads, facing opposition from pastors of all the mainline churches. They kept on going. And because of their faithfulness, we are here today. May we take courage and hope from their example to be bright, beaming lights in our own neighborhoods. Until that day when you come to take us home with you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Feel free to come up and look at your...